Hi, welcome to Scott Plays and another topic of the week. This last discussion was on randomness in games and I asked, do you like games to have lots of randomness, none at all or somewhere in between? Do you prefer input randomness, i.e. roll a die, then make a decision based on the result? Or output randomness, that is, make a decision to take an action, then roll a die to see if it succeeds? And what games do randomness well, in your opinion? Now, I hope to get more response on this topic than I did. Um, I think it's a very interesting um, subject within game design. Um, but the one response I did get was from Ronald, and he said, I'm a dice roller. I prefer games where rolling dice is a huge part of the game. Dice Masters, Rally Man, D-Day Dice, Too Many Bones and Yahtzee. While Roll and Move comprises a lot of these types of games, some use them as an integral part of the game, like in Dice Masters. But as anyone who likes dice games, it is all about uh, dice randomness and the manufacturing quality. Games that implement lots of options for a missed roll are quickly becoming some of my favourites. Okay, so Ron touched on a, a few of the the um, points that I, I wanted to discuss uh, today. Um, I think, as I said, I think randomness is a very interesting um, subject within games and game design. I think it tends to get quite a bad rap. Um, there are a lot of gamers that really dislike um, randomness and particularly dice. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do with dice and other sources of randomness that I think add a lot of interest to a game. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that a game without any randomness isn't really a game. It's a puzzle. And so let's talk about some of the sources of randomness. We've all already mentioned dice. The other one that most people will be very familiar with is cards. Um, you then have um, sort of tokens that you draw from maybe a cup or a bag or something like that. And then the one that a lot of people sort of overlook is player randomness. And in this case, it might be better to use the word uh, or the term uncertainty rather than randomness. Um, but... Uh, yeah, basically the, the other players around the table provide a source of randomness um, whilst you're playing because you, you don't know what they're going to do. And these different sources of randomness behave in different ways. So, for example, let's take dice to begin with. Um, if you roll a single six-sided die, you've always got a one in six chance of getting any of those sides. If you add a second uh, six-sided die, you roll both of them together, you can produce a result between two and twelve, and the distribution of those numbers follows a triangle. Um, and then as you add more dice, it starts to um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It the the distribution curve becomes closer and closer to a uh, standard bell curve. And and one of the things that I I think people 
um, think when they think of dice is that more dice is more random, but in fact it's not because you're getting closer and closer to this um, bell curve distribution and that's actually less random. <laughs> um, you're more likely to roll numbers near the centre and anybody that's played uh, Settlers of Catan will be um, aware that, or in fact any game in which you roll two six-sided dice, um, you'll be aware of the fact that the most likely number that you're going to roll is a seven. And that's because that's the number that's at the top of the triangular distribution on a 2d6 roll. Uh, and so, yeah, dice give you nice, predictable um, distribution that's always fixed every single time you roll the dice. Cards can be used to mimic that kind of probability curve, but they can all be also be used in other ways. Um, usually, randomness with cards is you draw a card, you know, it might have a value, it might give you an instruction to do, but it's then placed in a discard pile, and that's result is no longer available um, to the players until the discard pile is reshuffled and put back in and formed back into a deck so the probabilities of getting any particular result are changing all the time whenever you draw a card from a deck uh, now you can you can um, get the same result as dice by drawing the card, putting it back, shuffling, you know, and doing that every single time you draw a card. But, you know, almost no games do that because it's such a hassle. Um, and so, yeah, cards give you this um, different changing probability space, um, which is, yeah, can be very useful. Um, it's they're often misused as well going back to the example of settlers of Catan, uh, you can buy a deck of cards that mimic the or are supposed to mimic the probabilities of the dice but because you draw a card you know and it's basically got one of the 36 possible combinations of two uh, six sided dice um, and yeah, so see, so like the majority of them are going to be, or well, half of them, I think, if that's, yeah, if I'm doing my, see, I'm not sure about that, but the most common <laughs> number in there is a seven. So say you get a seven, you discard it, there's now one less seven in that deck. So the chances of you drawing a seven are reduced. And so that doesn't precisely mimic the um, dice rolling and so the the chances of getting particular results within the game changes and um, yeah as I was saying I think you know the cards can be misused in that way um, but that changing probability is a really interesting feature in a lot of games. Uh, again, you can mimic both those types of things with pulling tokens out of bags or cups or something. Because, you know, again, you could have, instead of a deck of cards, um, let's, let's take a standard... Um, deck of poker cards, you know, your, your standard playing cards, uh, ace through king, four suits. Uh, you could have the, what was it, 52 different tokens in a bag that all represent ace through king of the four different suits, and you could just pull a, a, a token out. That gives you your, your result. You discard it and that's exactly the same as drawing a card from a standard deck. Um, 
But the interesting thing that tokens allow you to do is to easily change um, the the contents of the bag, uh, and it it's obviously you can do that with a deck of cards as well. You can have cards that you insert into, but whenever you do that, you need to shuffle. A bag is pretty much you put one in, you give it a quick shake, and it's shuffled. You know, it's a it's a much more convenient way to do that um, to get both. Well, you get a sort of combination of the the fixed probabilities because you can put the token back in that you draw. So you, if the contents of the bag doesn't change, then the probabilities never change. But you could change the probabilities. Um, as you're going along and uh, this is where we see the sort of bag building mechanic come in where you're putting say different coloured cubes in a bag and you draw some of them out and um, you maybe keep some of those and then you do some actions and other cubes go back in so the, the, the distribution of cubes within the bag changes throughout the game uh, and that's that's the kind of thing you can you can do with a uh, a token pull system um and yeah lastly is uh as i said player randomness and that can you know that is that is the most unpredictable <laughs> of any of the, the randomness systems um yeah you, you and it's it in a way it's the most flexible. You don't know what a player is going to do. Um, you can you can sort of try and predict things. So you can and and this is the 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 great thing about player randomness is you can look at what your opponents are doing within the game, and you can sort of. Um, work out what they're most likely to do but you never know for certain uh and that i think i think anybody that plays games um will understand that the most interesting variability and randomness within a game comes from the other people round the table it's not from the dice it's not from the cards it's not from drawing tokens out of a bag it's those other players and the the things that they do and you know um it's joe's turn and you think i know, i know exactly what joe's doing but he does something completely different and it's like what okay now you've done that i can sort of see why you might want to do that but that completely changes what i'm going to do and yeah you can't get that kind of thing from any other um source of randomness um sort of the automa systems um that you get in many solo games they sort of try and mimic other players by using you know, card draws or dice rolls or even pulling tokens out of a bag. But they never do it because they they can never... There's, there's a sort of creativity within the randomness of other players that you can't mimic with any of these other uh, sources of randomness. Um... So, having talked about sources of randomness, let's talk about the, the sort of two different types of randomness, input and output randomness. So, as I said uh, in my questions, input randomness is where you produce some kind of random result, for example, the roll of a die. Um, that gets you a, yeah, as I said, a result, and you then make a decision based on that result. Output randomness is the opposite of that, where you make a decision and you then get a random result, 
such as a roll of a die, to see whether that decision is successful. And I think a lot of the people that dislike randomness in games dislike output randomness, where you know they're making a decision and then something random happens that sort of either validates or invalidates that decision. Uh, and that is certainly my least favourite type of randomness. But at the same time, I think it's a very useful tool within game design and um, used well. It's, uh, it is a, an extremely... Uh, it gives sort of... Um, it, it works really well in sort of simulations and um, sort of more conflict heavy games where you don't want stuff to be completely predictable but you want a, yeah you want a sort of the the unpredictability of real life to be within the game in some way um input randomness on the other hand is generally what most players like in terms of randomness um yeah, you roll a die, you draw a card, then you make a decision. And yeah, that that's good because, you know, you're getting the the information up front for you to then uh mitigate or use in some way. Um and yeah, it's it's just it's a bit it's less random. Um <laughs> but that means it's kind of less realistic in some ways um, and that brings us on to probability management and um, I think something that is thought about games with a lot of randomness is that they lack skill um, but whether it's input randomness or output randomness actually managing that and managing the uncertainty is in itself a skill and i think poker is a really good example of a high skill game that has a huge amount of both input and output randomness uh, particularly um what's it called hold'em Texas Hold'em poker, um, sort of the the a style of poker that you see on um, uh, TV programs that are covering poker tournaments and sort of the the professional poker um, style, if you like, um, where you get two hold cards, um, so that's input randomness. Uh, you're getting two random cards you're then making your decisions based on those cards uh, you then get sort of a, a series of random steps that are kind of a bit input and a bit output which are your river cards and then eventually or the flop cards um, and then eventually you get the turn and the river and the river is pure output randomness it not in every hand but in a good number of hands that will determine the winner but if you look at the results of poker tournaments it's easy to see that there is a huge amount of skill in playing poker um, and of course you also got player randomness within there um, there sort of bluffing and betting that's all um, working on the uncertainty of what other players will do and it's, it's a really good illustration of that sort of predictable uh, part of player randomness because players get sort of um, what they call table image where uh, 
um, their pattern of betting um, sort of puts them in into sort of different categories of you know are they a cautious or a uncautious better or and that kind of thing um, and yeah good poker players will be able to pick up on that and read that and they'll be able to read other signals about what the player is doing and from that work out the likelihood without ever actually knowing for certain what the likelihood of them having particular cuts is for example um so yeah uh poker is a great example of a game that shows that randomness mitigation is definitely a skill um and whilst we're talking about examples of games um let's look at uh some examples of games that use randomness well um I think one of my favourites is the Castles of Burgundy. Uh, with that, you uh, you have two dice that you roll. Um, they're used individually to select actions. Um, you have ways of mitigating that. Um, it's input randomness in that the, the dice are rolled at the beginning of the round and then you make your decisions based on those values that you get uh, there are a ton of options of what you can do with um, a, a single an individual die there's ways that you can adjust the values um, and so yeah I think Castles of Burgundy is a really good example of input randomness done really well um, along with dice mitigation um, a good example of output randomness is one of my current favourite games, Root. Um, in that, um, the majority of it is... Uh, well, there, there are two sources of randomness. There's card draw and there's dice rolls. Uh, the, the card draw is input randomness in that you... you you get random cards and you make decisions based on what cards you have. And there's output randomness in the dice rolls. And everything else in the game is completely deterministic. There, there's no, uh, no other sources of randomness. And the way the dice rolls work is when you go into battle with an opponent... Um, you have you have warriors, um, and if if you're not familiar with the, the game, it's a sort of red wall style uh, setting where you're playing uh, essentially woodland creatures that are fighting for control over clearings within um, this uh, forest or woodland, and yeah, you so you have little warrior meeples um, and you can move those from clearing to clearing and then do battle with somebody else that is in a clearing that you're in and when you do when you uh, fight a battle you roll what's essentially two four-sided dice they're actually they eight or no they must be twelve sided and there's uh, naught to three uh, three times on the dice and unless you're playing one of the particular factions whoever is attacking or rather unless the defender is playing one of the particular factions whoever is attacking gets the higher roll of the two dice and the defender gets the lower roll and you simply remove uh, a number of warriors from your opponent up to either the number of warriors you have or the value on the die, uh, whichever is lowest, essentially. And uh, so there's a very small range of possible outcomes there. Um, so you can, although it is pure output randomness, it's kind of mitigated output randomness in that the, 
the range is small and you know that say you you take six warriors and you move them into a clearing and then you battle against three warriors even if the worst outcome is that uh you roll two threes you're going to kill all of the opponents and they're going to kill half of yours but you you know that you're going to have three left over so you can go into a battle knowing that okay even if i get the worst roll for me i've still got however many warriors left in that clearing um and yeah as i was saying there's there is one faction where it works slightly differently if in the if they're the defender they always get the highest so if you're attacking them you always want to go in with at least four warriors because um they could get a three and you could get a zero and that means you don't kill any of them but they kill three of yours uh and so yeah it's um yeah i think it's it's a really good example of the the use of output randomness done really well uh, because it is although it is unpredictable it's managed really well because of yeah as i was saying the the range of possibilities is so small and you how you can you decide how many warriors you take into a battle um and finally um a game that does um a mixture of input and output randomness and token pools um really well and has a lot of mitigation and mitigation that um I think works really well is um Arkham Horror the card game uh in this uh you know you've got there's so many sources of randomness in there you've got your own investigator deck that you're drawing cards from you've got the uh encounter deck that um you draw a card per player from every single round and that has different sort of events and monsters and stuff in it um you have a certain amount of um sort of set up randomness um which is something i haven't really mentioned yet i mean there's you know you get another way that randomness is used in games is actually in the setup of a game and in arkham horror the car game um the <coughs> um setup of the scenario is uh, often randomized randomized to a degree where you've got different locations and often there are multiple copies of a location and you choose one of those versions so you know that there's a certain location you just don't know what effect it has um and then there is the token pull they have um what they call a chaos bag um the game doesn't actually come with a bag which i think is a bit disappointing but that's a different subject um but you have all of these chaos tokens that um most people will use a dice bag you can use a cup you can use a bowl or whatever you want really um and yeah the uh the die the um chaos tokens have uh either values sort of a, either negative or positive or zero values or one of a small number of um symbols on them and whenever you um do certain things within the game for example fighting uh you do what's uh referred to as a skill test and you reach inside the bag you draw out a token and <clears throat> the value if it's a value is added to your skill value and there is a um there will be something for example if you're fighting a monster the monster will have a strength and you're looking to get your fight 
plus the token value above the strength of the monster in order to be able to deal damage to it. Uh, now, as well as that, you can sort of com what they call commit cards from your hand to, and this is where the mitigation comes in, to increase your skill value. So let's say you know that the most negative value in the chaos bag is a minus three and your skill is your fighting skill is three your monster has a fighting skill of two you're already one up but i can't remember what i said now <laughs> let's say it's minus minus two is the heart the, the most negative value so the worst you can do is draw out Although, well, it's not actually the worst you can do. But if you were looking at just the, the values that are in the chaos bag, um, the worst you can do is draw out the minus two. So you want to be able to increase your uh, skill value by uh, two more. Um, or, well, one more because ties always go toward, to the player's favour. Uh, anyway, yeah. What I was saying was you have cards in your hand that you can commit to these skill tests which increase your skill value. Um, you also have cards that you can have in play that will um, give you static buffs to your skill value. Um, there are other ones where you can spend resources to increase your skill value. Um, and you do all of that before you draw the token. So you can sort of get yourself within... Um, the range of being sure that you're either guaranteed based on the the number the value um, tokens to succeed or you have a very good probability of succeeding um, but then that's where the symbol tokens come in as I said there's a number that have one of a, a very small number of symbols um most of those when you uh play a scenario you'll get a card that tells you what all those symbols mean and they're generally a negative value based on some kind of game state thing like um for example how many ghouls are there in play you know that kind of thing um and there's also then two special tokens a auto fail and an elder sign so the elder sign is the really good one that is basically an automatic success it doesn't matter what your skill value is it doesn't matter how hard the task is generally this is not always true but generally if you draw the auto the uh, elder sign you succeed and you get other good stuff happening uh the auto fail though is always an auto fail and it's the nastiest token in there and it's what makes that token pull system so good because no matter how many cards you committed you always know that there is a really small chance of you drawing that auto fail token and it just it's there is a uh and it, it's one of the re reasons i don't think that um arkham horror the card game works or would work very well on a digital uh implementation because there's a, a visceral thing that you you get when you put your hand inside the bag and you you shuffle the tokens about and you you grab hold of one and you pull your hand out just hoping <laughs> that it's not going to be that auto fail tentacles token uh and and yeah people make the mistake of saying as long as we don't draw <laughs> the auto fail and then of course you know it doesn't matter what's in there you're going to draw that as soon as you've said that and it, it's just yeah it's a brilliant brilliant system in that game um because yeah although it's uh pure output randomness it works so well and as i said you can mitigate it and it's just the 
the whole feeling of drawing that token out just works brilliantly. Um, and the mix of tokens can change throughout a campaign or even within the middle of a scenario it could change. And it's just, yeah, there are so many things you can do with that which you could do with cards, but it would be a bit more clunky. You'd have to keep shuffling the cards all the time and, you know, it's... Um, yeah, the, the token pool works really well and, and you couldn't do with dice. I mean, you could make... I suppose you could do it with having lots and lots of dice and but um yeah tokens in a bag just works so well anyway i've probably talked for quite a while about um randomness as i said it's one of my uh, favorite um subjects within game design because I, I think there's so many things you can do with it and it's it, it as i said i i don't think a game without randomness is not a game and the way randomness, or the different ways that randomness can be used, uh, really gives games their sort of texture, and um, it, it makes it makes a game what it is, in my opinion. So, thank you for listening to me ramble on about randomness. Um, I hope you all um, get engaged with. Um, the topic of the week discussion um, over in the Scott Plays uh, Facebook group as usual links in the description um, and please come back and watch more of my videos in the future <laughs>